listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. It is a book that will perhaps go down as the report from Engine Company 82 of our generation. They Saved New York, written by Glenn Uston and Dan Potter, a retired New York City firefighter, explores the men and women of the FDNY and their respective journeys into the department. From everyone, from firefighters on the fire floor to those who were in positions of command, such as lieutenant, captain, and chief, and so on and so forth, this book explores their stories told through their perspectives. Each story differs, but the mission is the same. And the common theme is this, those that put their lives in the line to save their fellow New Yorker, no matter the cost, no matter the situation, whenever they were in need. Get your hands on this book today. You will not regret it. Written by, once again, retired New York City firefighter Dan Potter and the concept and photography provided by the one and only Glenn Usden, a member of the Firebell Club in New York City. They saved New York, the men and women of the FDNY. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can do so at theysavedny.com. That is, again, www.theysavedny.com. Thanksgiving in North America is an annual national holiday marked by religious observances and a traditional meal, including turkey. The holiday commemorates a harvest festival celebrated by the pilgrims in 1621 and is held in the United States on the fourth Thursday in November. For the majority of the United States citizens, Thanksgiving is a day usually spent at home or at a family or friend's home, enjoying the traditional day's feast and everything that goes with the holiday cheer. There is turkey, football, desserts, and good times spent with family and friends. For the firefighter, however, it's a day away from their families, protecting life and property. The day or night is spent with their other family, the brothers and sisters they made an oath with to protect their communities even on holidays like Thanksgiving or Christmas. Of course, they celebrate Thanksgiving in the firehouse. There's a turkey and, of course, plenty of football. However, at any given moment, they may be called to carry out duties to protect others. In this show, we will talk about some of the more memorable Thanksgiving Day fires. First, the Minneapolis Thanksgiving Day fire destroyed two buildings, covering an entire block of downtown Minneapolis on November 25th and November 26th, 1982. The 16-story headquarters of Northwestern National Bank what is now known as Wells Fargo, and the vacant, partially demolished location formerly occupied by Donaldson's department store, which had recently moved across the street to the new city center mall. Nobody was injured or killed as a result of the fire, though 10 firefighters were treated at hospitals. The Minneapolis Fire Department quickly determined the cause of the fire as arson. Shortly thereafter, two juveniles were arrested for setting the fire using an acetylene torch found at the partially demolished Donaldson site. The charges or later dropped. In 1988, Northwestern National Bank, then called Norwest Corporation, constructed a 57-story Cesar Pelli design headquarters on the site of the bank building. The new headquarters is now known as the Wells Fargo Center after Norwest merged with Wells Fargo. The Donaldson's half of the block is occupied by the Saks Fifth Avenue wing of Gavaday Common, an upscale shopping mall. It started late on Thanksgiving Day 1982, November 25th to be exact, 41 years ago today. Flames erupted from the vacant former Donaldson's department store building in downtown Minneapolis and quickly spread to the upper floors of the adjacent 16-story Northwestern National Bank building. It started in the Donaldson building and the building was in a state of demolition. Then Minneapolis Deputy Fire Chief Larry Muscalic told NPR News at the time from the scene along Nicolette Mall. The fire spread straight up and went in the windows just immediately. And within just a very few minutes of the first alarm, we had about eight floors of the bank building going all at the same time. This may not be under, be under control for some time. We have Alan Cox now standing by live at the scene. Alan? Pat, we're told here that 100 firefighters are still on the job in downtown Minneapolis, and there are dozens other police for crowd and traffic control. It is the largest, one of the largest firefighting efforts in the history of Minneapolis for one of the city's biggest fires. It was and is one of the prime pieces of Minnesota real estate. Part of it was coming down anyway, the old Donaldson's building. But firefighters quickly realized it would go well beyond that. The demolition wreckage served as a giant pile of kindling. First on the scene, a crew from Station House One interrupted in their Thanksgiving dinner. Their off-duty brethren had been doing the same. Eating turkey dinner. And uh, we turned on the news and we saw the fire and they said, General Alarm, come on, all men off-duty, come to work. Report to work. And that's what we did. Is this unusual for you on a holiday? No, we seem to have big fires on holidays. They left to staff other fire stations. St. Paul and suburban departments helped out. 
More Minneapolis fire crews sped downtown. They pumped a wall of water on neighboring buildings. Flames couldn't breach the IDS tower, but heat could. It popped windows. Guests of the tower's Marquette Hotel were evacuated from their rooms. But the thousands of gallons of water were not enough to save the headquarters of Northwestern National Bank. Fire jumped to the upper floors of the building, the bank's administrative offices. The fire moved up in the high rise and down toward the lower levels. All of our records, of course, are carried in duplicate, so those will have to be duplicated and will be costly and time consuming, but will not uh, cause us any great problem. Beyond the equipment and records and money, the bank contained history, typified by an exhibit of the Jenny, the first airplane of Charles Lindbergh. It escaped the early stages of the fire, but smoke and water had poured into the exhibit area. Firefighters early on could not be sure holiday workers had escaped the bank. The people in charge of that side will be doing a search. We just found out about it right now, and the men are on their way over there to explain what and where they may be, if they are. And we will, they will institute a search at this time. Onlookers were drawn to the fire, some who'd been downtown to browse Christmas displays, some attracted by news reports or the eerie glow. One of the onlookers was the city's mayor, praising the emergency workers, but admitting the best they could do was keep the fire from spreading. When you think of the modern construction downtown, uh, you, you just don't expect a fire of this kind. It's not the word that uh, we have right now is not hard word on what the cause of the fire may have been. We do know that earlier this evening, authorities were looking for a man and a woman reportedly seen near the fire shortly after it began. Uh, we do not have official word that the fire is under control at this point, but from the mall side, all we can see is smoke. The flames of that block from the mall side have all disappeared. Uh, we're told by uh, the authorities that there has been no hard information yet on whether there were any casualties inside the bank building, but there's no indication of any at this time. Uh, the most serious injury we've heard of is a fireman who apparently wrenched his shoulder and is far from in serious condition. And also some of the merchants in the downtown area surrounding this block are here tonight trying to board up some of the windows that were blown out by the radiant heat and trying to contain the damage to their merchandise. But the indications for now are that the merchants in downtown Minneapolis will be open tomorrow on a regular schedule for what is the busiest retail day of the year. Pat? All right, Alan, thank you very much. Well, as he just mentioned, a bulletin was issued earlier regarding two possible arson suspects. Two people, as Alan said, were reportedly seen near the old Donaldson's building around the time the fire began, a man and a woman. A six-story building on the corner of Kingston and Bedford, located in the heart of Boston's downtown neighborhood, erupted in a massive four-alarm fire on Thanksgiving Day of 1889. The blaze spread to adjacent buildings situated along the city block. While emergency responders worked hard to knock down the flames, five Boston firefighters would tragically lose their lives. And Boston suffered nearly $4 million, the equivalent of $120 million today, worth of property damages. The month of November is considered the cruelest month to the Boston Fire Department. Box 52 would sound an alarm at 8 a.m. that rainy Thanksgiving morning, giving a signal to the firefighters to respond. That box has a history among the city's famous and out-of-control fires. It was the same fire box to alert firefighters of the Great Boston Fire of 1872, when 776 buildings burned to the ground, 65 acres of land were left in ruins, and the cost of the property losses near $75 million, or the equivalent of $1.7 billion today. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygienol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, 
Groves gear racks and washer dryers, SuperVac fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. The Boston Fire Department became a great firefighting force, unfortunately, through necessity. Former Boston Fire Commissioner Paul Christian was quoted as saying back in 2012, The old town of Boston was built on wood. The original chimneys were built of wood, and it was a very combustible city as a result. The weather on the night before the now infamous Thanksgiving Day fire of 1889 has inspired at least one theory regarding the spark behind the blaze. If you look back at old photographs of Boston and New York in the 1870s and 1880s, Christian would add, you'll notice there were a lot of telegraph wires all over the place. Back then, the telegraph was a principal means of communication. The fire alarm systems were on those telegraph lines, and in those days, some companies also sold time. A Boston time company regularly issued a timeout over the circuits to keep all the clocks of companies and businesses on the accurate time. The pouring rain on the eve of Thanksgiving created problems in the circuits, and Commissioner Christian believed an electrical fire thus caused a blaze. When the first fire apparatus arrived on the scene, thick black smoke was billowing out of the sixth floor windows. The fire jumped across the street and into the Ames building, and firefighters from host company 7 and ladder company 3 raced into the Ames building to stop the fire spread. The structural properties of the building gave way, and the walls collapsed, killing five. The dead included hoseman John J. Brooks Jr., 29, host company 7, hoseman Michael Murnane, 34, also of host company 7, Latterman Daniel J. Buckley, 31, of Ladder Company 3, Latterman Frank P. Loker, 33, of Ladder Company 3, and lastly, Hoseman Edward E. Whiting, a retired member of the Boston Fire Department. In addition to the fallen firefighters, the collapse destroyed several firefighting apparatuses, including the steamer of Engine Company 26 and an aerial truck of Ladder Company 13. A water tower, an early predecessor to firefighting apparatuses that shoot a stream of water into upper floors of buildings, was also tragically destroyed. The steamer of Engine Company 22 survived the falling debris, however, it would suffer damages too. I'm confident that Thursday's fire had been burning for a long time before it was discovered, a Boston Fire Department investigator assigned to the case recalled. If a watchman had been on hand to ring in an alarm as soon as the fire started, I am confident that Chief Lewis Weber and his men could never have allowed the fire to spread beyond the building. Boston would suffer yet another tragedy on Thanksgiving Day, this time in 1942, when the Coconut Grove fire took the lives of more than 490 people. Reports determined all who were killed died in the initial 15 minutes of the inferno. November 22nd, 2022, the Bronx, New York City, Thanksgiving Day. A father and his daughter with special needs were both tragically killed on that day when a blaze broke out in their Bronx apartment while two others in the unit were hospitalized in critical condition. Perfecto Aramboles, aged 60, and his daughter, Odalis Aramboles, aged just 22, died in the inferno that ripped through their second-floor abode in the five-story building located in Mount Hope around 5.30 that morning, according to both the FDNY and NYPD. The young woman was taken to Bronx Care Health System and the father to St. Barnabas, where both tragically succumbed to their crucial injuries. The man's wife, Lorena Suarez, age 63, and her daughter, Rosana Suarez, age 43, remained in critical condition at Jacoby Medical Center. That was horrible what happened, a neighbor by the name of Lucy Lopez told the New York Post. The association's latest home cooking fires report shows that Thanksgiving is the peak day for U.S. home cooking fires, followed by the day before Thanksgiving and, of course, Christmas Day. According to the report, U.S. fire departments responded to an estimated 1,630 home cooking fires on Thanksgiving Day, three and a half times an average day. Unattended cooking was by far the leading cause of associated fires and fire deaths. Cooking is the leading cause of U.S. home and home fire injuries year-round and the second leading cause of home fire deaths. Leatherhead Nation, we have a lot to be thankful for on this Thanksgiving. Our family, our friends, all of our loved ones. Most of all, we should be thankful because we get to ride out on that big red fire truck and play superhero every time we go to work. There is no greater occupation on this planet than being a firefighter. Thank you for letting Lou, myself, and the rest of the Get and Salty crew bring this community together from all corners of the world. 
If you are in fact working on Thanksgiving, be safe and enjoy every single moment you have on this magic carpet ride. Happy Thanksgiving from Lou, myself, Gonzo, Tank, and MC. Until we see you again, stay low and low.